Fabulous. We've just got a few more people coming in, but good morning, everyone, for another Connect and Share on a Friday morning. Um, I still can't believe it's November, but here we are. And uh, only two months left before we jump into 2022, which seems so bright on the horizon. I reckon the future of 22 is going to be incredible for our industry, but we've got a bit of road to get to before we get there. Before we kick off and I introduce our guest speaker, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we all meet today. I come from Darug and Garangai country. And uh, here um, we try to thank and honour our Aboriginal ancestors, both past, present, and also our emerging leaders, because we need to understand more about the land on which we traverse to do our activities every day. And we want to involve them in what we do so that we can understand more about their traditions, their background, and what they have done for thousands of years before we even took place on this planet. So can I start uh, by introducing, and I'm going to jump to Kimberly's slide, um, Kimberly Canyon. Now, Kimberly, I saw this amazing thing pop up on Facebook and I couldn't help but say, please come and talk to us more about this. So um, this is a passion area. I've spoken to several of our members about the struggles of being a woman in the outdoors. And um, so I'm, I'm going to throw to you and if you can tell us a little bit about your group and what you're hoping to achieve. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm Kim and I've um, been in the outdoor industry for a bit over a decade and just have a little baby just with a dad at the moment um, and have just in the term for work been struggling with how to do that. And um, I'm lucky, I'm very supported in my work. I work at the Southern Outlook in Boona in Queensland and it's a government job and we have paid maternity leave and a lot of flexibility in my return to work but um, talking to other mums and people wanting to be mums in the industry that seems a bit far from the norm and I, I was looking for a group where we could share stories, advice, um, job opportunities that support mothers or primary caregivers in the industry and a, and a platform for advocacy and I couldn't find one and so I asked around and I thought well if there isn't one let's make one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So tell us a bit, bit about what you're hoping to do on the Facebook page itself and what sort of conversations you want to get going and if there's any outcomes that you're thinking we can achieve with that. Yeah, I, I'm interested in doing a, like a weekly question and the members can answer and that way we can start sort of a weekly discussion about certain topics um, one that's interesting is workplaces that do support and what that support looks like. Um, a couple of women spoke about have, being able to um, breastfeed while running climbing programs or on the river. Um, how do we support women who want to pump? Um, so interesting things like that. Uh, another topic would be um, for people thinking about having children in the field and, and what what questions they have of those who are already doing it. Um, I'd like to make it inclusive. So it involves not just mums, but primary caregivers um, and their allies, because I'm sure there's a lot of employers out there looking at how they can better support their staff. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. And One of the biggest questions I think we have to ask is, do you have to be a mum to join the group? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. I think... Um, the more inclusive, just like community, um, these groups are, the more we can achieve. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking for uh, advice on how to change the, the name to something still short, <laughs> but reflect. <laughs> um, everything I tried was about, uh, you know, 15 words long. Yeah. <laughs> so we can ask anyone on, on channel today that, uh, you know, if you've got any suggestions, just flick them through to yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I'll, Want to put a little poll up in the on the page and see what suggestions come out yeah wonderful and i, I know we have someone that's uh, perfectly positioned to be involved in this group on on screen today but um you know i think what you said about the challenges of women in the outdoors is certainly heard loud what do you see as probably one of the biggest opportunities um of, of having a group like this i i think it's a, a place where 
the mothers uh, and primary caregivers can have a collective voice and start to advocate for change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, united, we're, we're able to achieve a lot more than feeling a lot of women that I've spoken to have said, oh, I haven't met anyone else or that there's very few people we're spread out because we're not reflected as much in the industry anymore. Mm. Um, there's a distance uh, between us. So being able to meet online um, brings people together that we normally wouldn't find each other. Mm, absolutely. And Dave made a, a great point uh, inside the outhouse. Dave, did you want to just quickly talk about that session you had? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, David Maskell from uh, Inside the Outhouse. Um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we had a really big turnout and um, it was uh, a wide ranging discussion and covered areas around, um, you know, um, instructors, female instructors, women instructors becoming pregnant and how that disrupts their career. And, um, and, and it was quite an engaging discussion. We got more than our usual five people in the room, which was good for us. Uh, and this was about August actually last year. So worth going back and having a look at. Interestingly enough, it hasn't had many views since then. So Perhaps it's an area we need to revisit. Um, and Kim, we'd be happy to promote your uh, your Facebook page and uh, and give you any support we can um, directing our, our our followers and our interested uh, parties um, towards uh, a, a greater discussion in this area. Amazing. Even just the, the joint promotion with those two groups would be um, a great opportunity for many people to connect with either one. So thanks, Dave. That's great. Awesome. Does anyone have any questions for Kim while we've got her on the line? Is there something that um, we see this group could do or any other questions you might have? Yeah, you shall. <laughs> Hello, Kim. Nice to meet you here. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Perfect. Yep. Um, yeah, I actually thinking about this question because I'm a, I have a baby four and a half months old, so I'm kind of in the position of going, uh, I really want to go back to industry, industry, and how do I do it? So my first, well, my question will be, what was the first outdoor adventure you and your child do together, and how was it? How did you feel? You know, what was the challenges there? I mean, it's more than one question, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, Thank you, Yushan, and thanks for your message online as well. <laughs> so I, I've been bushwalking since I was two months old. We're lucky to live in National Park um, up in Mount Nebo where we are and found that was amazing and it's totally side to this. So I'm trying to start up a business um, taking mums and babies bushwalking just because that was so helpful for me and navigating carriers made life a lot easier um, to do things around the house after. So that was the first little bush, little, um, little adventure and then lots of camping. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So there you go, Yusha. We need to start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's really inspiring because I was like, well, and what time should I go back, you know, taking the baby out and what do I need to prepare? I think I have that fear of going, can I take care of the baby out there? Um, oh. So it's really good to have this group that I can join and ask questions. Oh. Yeah, cool. Thank you. If it's anything like me, my teenagers is, uh, are never home, so I actually meet them in the outdoors because <laughs> that's the only space I get to see them. <laughs> they, they use home as just a place to dump their washing. <laughs> but uh, great. Thank you so much, Kim, for bringing that to us. And I hope that you get a lot more followers and a lot more engagement in that. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll see great things from that group. And if not, just the discussion will be very worthwhile. Thanks so much, Laurie, for inviting me to share and thanks for all the support. Um, it's very Absolute exciting. Absolute pleasure. We've got a we've got a team up in this industry and uh, and get a, a bigger voice. So uh, anything we can do, and Dom's on the line. So, you know, I know that he does the same in Queensland. Andrew Knight does the same in Victoria, and we all talk. So, you know, trying to get that whole of country approach to, to networking and combining a voice. Fantastic. Fabulous. Now, Brianna hasn't joined us, unfortunately, so something must have happened. So we'll make sure we get Brianna back uh, onto one of our Connect and Shares in the future. But Brianna is the New South Wales representative on ABAT. And uh, the symposium happened this week. So she, she might be caught up in the post uh, 
post event blues that you have after an event like that but I hear it went exceptionally well uh, did anyone attend the symposium this week I was meaning to I didn't get a chance to even knock on but uh, yeah we'll bring that to you at another time Awesome, we'll move on to our, our third topic, and this probably will take up a considerable amount of our, our time today. But uh, last night we had our very first Careers in the Outdoor webinar, and this was supported by Study Work Grow, which is a great um, organisation based in Queensland. Why do you get all the good companies, Dom? Um, <laughs> they, they do a fabulous thing in uh, emailing um, all of potential career options to students from years nine to 12 and, uh, and really get out all the different options that kids have before them today. And we've been lucky enough to plug in the outdoors in amongst those conversations. And they promoted uh, this webinar, which we ran last night, and then we got the New South Wales Government on board and Department of Education in supporting it too. Um, it, was a, it was a great session. And I thought I'd just share a couple of things that uh, actually they spoke about last night. We had four guest speakers. Um, we had Richard Thornton from the OEG, the CEO of OEG, come and talk about their organisation, but where he had come from and where he went. And also, you know, what people can do to, to work with an organisation like OEG. We also had Brian Leachy from YouthWorks COE and uh, he spoke of the opportunities of, of the traineeships on offer and uh, and how it was a great way to start being educated but also get paid at the same time. We had Jemima Wheeler who uh, then spoke on the tourism side and she had a fabulous video where we had to sort of remind everyone that yes it looks amazingly fun and guess what you still get paid while you do this amazing stuff. So she did a great job in promoting uh, the tourism aspect of our industry and talking about some of the career options that stem off that as well. And then we have Becky Half, who uh, is the chair of ABAT and uh, she spoke about the therapy side and the connection between the health and therapeutic skills and the outdoor sector. So another area that people could, could uh, actually go into. So all in all, it was absolutely a, a great evening, a great start. We've already got a heap of people that want casual work um, that have registered to receive uh, job updates and things. And, uh, yeah, as I say, it can only go from strength to strength from here. And certainly our members will hear from me soon about some of those people that are looking for jobs. Um, now I just wanted to have a conversation with who is with us today around some of the career options. And Yushan has been amazing in helping me with some of that discussion around career options and supplying information to people like we had last night. So she's got a few questions which she would like to pose to who's on um, our session today to see if we can get some more in-depth understanding of, of the opportunities before us. I'm going to hand over to you, Yushan. Right. Well, guys, you know, I'm the one in the group asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, well, if you got a piece, piece of paper and a pen, um, maybe we can do this this way. So, you know, uh, it's kind of like a game we play in outdoors. So you can have a pop right down on one of the paper. <laughs> if you do have that piece of paper and a pen, yes. Yeah. Okay, and another one is, go on. Another one is, come on. You can do it on the other side. That's okay. Ah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. So I have prepared some questions. I'm going to, instead of asking them, I'm going to post them on the chat. Mm -hmm. So you can read through some of the questions and pick the one that you feel like to answer. And you feel, feel the, the one you feel, oh, I really want to answer that question. And then you go pop. Yeah, just show that paper on the group. Once you finish, you go con. And then the next person who wants to answer another question or the same question, you go pop. And when you finish, you go pop corn okay <laughs> so it's like a little game we can play okay all right <laughs> well initially we come up with this idea because you know like to know about this industry and the work opportunity well what's the best way then asking people who actually work in this this industry and hear their stories so that's why i i suggest to laurie well let's ask them questions 
Uh, so, all right, that's how where the idea coming from. I'm gonna post the questions now on the chat um, for everyone to have a read. And once you're ready, you go pop. And once you finish your answer, you go corn, right? So do we do one by one or do we do all of them? Um, just choose the one that you can, you want to answer the most. Yeah. I'll let someone else go first. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> yeah, well, you can choose one that you want to answer. That, that's the beauty of it. Instead of have to come up with an oh. answer for one question. Dom's got pop. Okay, cool. I'm going the easy one there, Yishan. What do I like about this industry? Yep. And it's a combination. Um, it's a, partly the people because they tend to be very positive even when they're dealing with difficult situations and they tend to deal with difficult situations well um, but it's also about the experiences and the passing on of knowledge and experiences to other people and underlying it all I think is also the health aspect of getting healthier people healthier communities and also contributing to a healthier country so I think that's the positivity that comes out from it so that's why I like this industry. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> awesome. Right. Okay. Pop. <laughs> um, I, I would like to address the challenges I'm facing because this is a perfect week to, to talk about this. Um, our awareness. Our, our biggest challenge, exactly what Don was just saying about the health and, and well-being of, of what the outdoor provides, Although people go, oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense. But we, we really do not have that embedded awareness and so much so that policymakers, land managers, landowners, we're not even halfway there in getting their commitment and understanding of what we provide. So that's my biggest challenge right now. Well, I shouldn't say at mine. It's our industry's biggest challenge right now. Come on. <laughs> Can I just follow on from that? I think it's also, it's actually trying to avoid the outdoors being taken for granted. I think, I think a lot of people, once you say it to them, they get it. They understand all those benefits that we are so, we know. But it's also about hammering at home and making sure this stuff isn't taken for granted, that there are places to go bushwalking with your two-month-old child and your 82-year-old parents um if you happen to have them you know so i think that's the thing it's, it's about having mm -hmm. oh, was that dave so, so yeah uh, i'm sorry right i shouldn't sit on the side of a river should i yeah? <laughs> yeah. um but uh i'm on the way somewhere as always what i like about the industry now is that uh for a person of you know slightly over 50 um yeah it's a place where it's a place to some degree we could get better where gender age um you know uh, disability lots of other things that can cause problems in other in other employment areas mm -hmm. actually don't exist to the level that they yeah they would in uh, in my peer group elsewhere say so yeah so as I've gone along in the industry over the last 30 years, the reasons why I'm here, why I stay, and that have changed, of course, yeah? Mm. Um, so for an older person, it keeps me fit. I get to play with all sorts of good toys. Uh, I get to hang around with younger people, um, and nobody thinks I'm old, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> awesome. David doesn't have a piece of paper, so I'm going to go corn for him. <laughs> Awesome. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Surely there's one. Oh, there I'll, we go. I'll, I'll have a go on the pop. Um, I'll answer the third question. What's your career pathway uh, look like? It's 
Awesome. There's no one single pathway in, a, in Australia, I don't, th I don't believe. Um, I, my pathway was ad hoc. I, I applied to go to summer camp in 1996 and fell in love with working with uh, young people. And previously I'd been a public servant in, in an office environment. And I was working, yeah, a couple of years in the summer camps and in Canada and uh, freelancing. Uh, effectively and then found my way back into the Australian marketplace of outdoor um, outdoor recreation and outdoor education ultimately and, and then worked for uh, bigger companies like OEG for a long period of time and mm -hmm. gradually acquired lots of skills and bits of paper and I'm still chasing bits of paper at this point um, in my new role I have to chase bits of paper for the Duke of Edinburgh which mm -hmm. is just crazy showing proof of stuff that I did 10 or 20 years ago in some cases making me sound awesome. really old like David Chitty um, <laughs> who's not old um, but there's no one pathway and I think that's the challenge that uh, I think a lot of uh, aspects of our industry whether you're recreationally focused educationally focused or in adventure tourism we don't have uh, single pathways and we don't have uh, lines of progression up the up the corporate chain. Sometimes you go up and sometimes you're going down on the on the pathway, uh, depending on you know you lose a job because of recession or COVID, and then suddenly you're back instructing and carrying a backpack. But then, oh. yeah, things change. Um, it's it's also a nice aspect for the industry, but it does mean there's a huge churn. We lose as many young people, I think, in their late twenties when they realise that you can't sustain. Uh, family, mortgages, uh, second cars uh, in a market where, you know, come the end of November, you're probably not looking at any work until February if you're working in the school sector um, to a greater or lesser extent. So mm. it has a lot of challenges and the, and the career pathways are really hard. I still encourage, I spoke to a young man this week uh, at a centre up on the Sunshine Coast and he was 21 and did an amazing job with my uh, grade fives. And I said, if you get the chance, go to summer camp because you'll see a really different culture. You see a really different side of outdoor recreation and education, mm. but you'll learn a lot really quickly. Um, but yeah, so don't, and I said to him, don't work in one place your entire life, your entire work career, yeah. Mm. Go and, 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 and spread your, Wait. Here's a good metaphor there, but yeah, yeah, spread your wings and, and go to various different places, work for big operators, work for small, work for not-for-profit, work for profit. If you want to make some money, that's where you're going to find it or work for a school. And, um, but, you know, um, yeah, the, I think the era of, uh, and David might disagree, but um, the, the era of working for one provider in one location oh. is long gone. And I think that's reflective of the wider community mm. as well. I think you've answered this um, in, in a certain way, but I was going to ask you, Dave, what was the most influential position on the, the balance of skills that you got um, out of all of your, your career? Um, I think it always goes back to um, you definitely find that um, you hark back to early parts of your career, which was seminal in terms of framing your style of facilitation or the things that you saw from a, a peer who had 10 years more experience than you or two years more experience. So for me, it'd be uh, working um, at a place called Snake Road Adventure Center in Wisconsin, where I was a ropes course intern for two months. It was an amazing learning experience. And I worked with some uh, second to none facilitators. And it might've been that shiny thing of look brand new and really good. Maybe they weren't as good as I thought, but they actually were as good as I thought because they did their jobs really well. They did it really professionally and they made it look really easy. Mm -hmm. And it's taken me hopefully uh, yeah, 20, 20 plus years to actually get to that point where I, I can facilitate similar to what they were delivering and get outcomes. And so it's frustrating when I see some of the same activities that were being run 26 years ago, still being run and sometimes being run really poorly with groups that I'm going out with now and I'm accountable to. But um, it's also reassuring to some extent to see that the old school stuff still exists in some format. So I think it's those early things, but you've got to recognize that those early things also need tweaking and advancement. And you need to be open to taking on new challenges or to expanding your comfort zone. I'm currently going through hoops with, um, or jumping through new training for me with Sailing Australia. I'm, I'm in charge of a, uh, a program that has sailing in it now. So I need to go and get up skilled not because I want to become the sailing guru, but because I want to know more about what I'm now responsible for so oh. I can be conversant and helpful within my program and not just be the guy who's, um, yeah, just moving the food boxes around. Well done. Yeah, that's great. And to know that your most influential position was only two months. 
Yes, um, it was intensive though. I worked yeah, every day. It was sort of like summer camp. Yeah, you know, I had one day off a week, and but it was it was very influential because the people. This resonates what Dom said. The people were amazing human beings um, outside of just being amazing facilitators of, of corporate and school based programming, and so they knew what they needed to do in order to get really meaningful outcomes across a wide range of client groups from school based to uh, religiously based groups because it was a Bible camp uh, site. Um, but strangely enough, they called it Snake Road Adventure Center. It was a, was a very interesting uh, tongue in cheek aspect there, but uh, it was an amazing location and it still goes on with their programming much the, the same way it was 26 years ago when I was first there. So, oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dave, I, I actually have a follow up question for you. Um, well, what advice would you give to people who, you know, like start just start working in the industry and they do want to stay and have a career in the industry instead of moving on to, you know, other areas? They, you know, they really love it and they want to stay. It's possible for them to find a career in the industry and just like you stay for a very long time yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what makes you stay? Uh, the, the people who know me in the room uh, are laughing at me uh, or with me, I think, as well. Um, uh, it's very easy to become very uh, disillusioned and, and quickly uh, re have, to, have to refocus your, um, uh, your, your life goals, I guess, if you have a family. And, and I, I don't have a family and I don't have a mortgage. Uh, yeah, I've got a 10-year-old car and yeah, credit card debt. And that's about all I have in my life beyond my job. So maybe I'm not the best person to be role modeling a successful career, but I have been in various management roles over, over the years and I'm in a management role again uh, at my current employer here on the on Gold Coast. I think you've got to be, uh, you've got to walk talk, you've got to be persistent, you've got to have resilience and you've got to be prepared to occasionally uh, carry a backpack and step back into a field role. And uh, I guess uh, as a new person, uh, don't be too, too quick uh, to jump into a management or a coordination role. Um, definitely there's that aspect of still having to, it sounds very old school, it makes me sound like I'm a, I'm a dad uh, and, and ancient in my, in my wisdom, but it, it, a lot of young folks want to get straight into program coordinating and then get out of carrying the backpack and do the vehicle movements and do all the other stuff. And I think sometimes that burns you up quicker than just being out with a group where you've got 10 to 12, 14 kids or 22 kids. But you get to know that group over three days or 19 days and it's your group. And that's where you get a lot of the intangible rewards of working in the industry. I now coordinate um, pro year level programs and I, uh, yeah, I was out with 111 year fives this week. I learned three names um, beyond the teachers that I was working with. So, and they were three great kids, but they were the only three kids that I had direct engagement with even though I was with a group um, so you've got to you've got to balance the fact that you know if you want to stay in the career long term you've got to find that point where you've got to get out of carrying a backpack and paddling a canoe directly and be the coordinator but value the time you've got and use that time to upskill get experience and get a wide range of experience that's not just again in one company or in one modality if you're just a paddler that's great but then you won't be very good at bushwalking and there's amazing bushwalking trips you'll miss out on likewise you know ropes courses are amazing uh and i've i've my background is all ropes courses but i'm now trying to cross skill into more climbing because there's a responsibility in my new role here at the school involving climbing and i'm finding that's an interesting area to investigate but i know i'm no good as a climate because i'm just too old and too round now to do it um but yeah um yeah, again i'm sort of going all over the place david chitty has got some he's got his hand up maybe he's got some other advice not along the same lines thanks dave yeah look i i think there are careers in the outdoors we're coming back to that uh we need to spend some time developing the pathways project yeah yeah, I think that the outdoors, as we've all discussed before, is a great uh, opportunity uh, to stay in for a while, learn good skills and go to other types of work and perhaps come back in in a volunteer or uh, even part-time or full-time later. I think there are a lot of um, part-time opportunities, uh, casual opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if you can have a job outside, you might be a tradesman, for instance, and you're working for yourself or you're, you're subbying for another trade you know, where you can come and go as you please as a casual and then you can work in the outdoors as well. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so that part 
part uh, other world and part real world. Our world is is an opportunity. Um, to me, I mean, if I couldn't be a leader in the field, most of the time, I wouldn't stay in the industry. Yeah, so the only reason I'm in the industry is because I can be one of the leaders on the river. I can carry a backpack and go on a, yeah, um, turn 70 with a pack on my back, uh, yeah, with a group of kids, uh, that type of thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. I think we need to get a group of people and sit down and, and draw a bit of a matrix of all the different types of ways you might be able to be a part of our our amazing industry. And we've got to remember that you know, military and police, uh, mining, uh, parkies and all those, there's a lot of other parts of our industry that aren't the, you know, the, the core bit perhaps, but it's still the outdoors, yeah? So uh, we shouldn't forget uh, those as well, yeah? You yeah. don't have to be a teacher and go and sit inside. You could be a park ranger and spend most of your time outside with luck. Mm. <laughs> Very good. Ron, off. Hi. Um, I guess probably one of the challenges I faced when, um, so I did all my training in Victoria and um, did really well and then moved up to New South Wales and um, outdoor ed wasn't a subject on the curriculum. I was a bit silly. I didn't, I thought outdoor ed was so huge and amazing um, and being young and not knowing. So I guess probably I, I was able to pick up some casual jobs and with some fantastic employers, but I really needed that more permanent work because you're going, hey, you know, I'm going to be setting up my life too. So I guess it's probably, oh gosh, in hindsight, I ended up in a local government job um, that did have a very strong outdoor ed program, so I was lucky. But my whole goal was to work with, you know, in, in outdoor ed in schools and, and year 11 and 12 subjects because, I, like, I did it and experienced it. It was fantastic. So um, I'm a big advocate for being on the curriculum and getting kids to do it because I don't think we're going to actually have that passion that we've all got mm. if we don't educate kids in school really strongly and not just a few we need to we need to get it really in there but um yeah I, I mean it, it sort of starts to the, the needing to have money draws you away a little bit um and then, yeah but that was I guess that's a challenge that I faced and I don't know if young people are still facing that um yeah oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for playing alone. <laughs> Did you have a follow-up question for Bron, Yishan? Or that um, not in a moment, um, but I think, um, yeah, we're just waiting for more people to share. Yeah, Good. sure. Yeah, Kim. <laughs> Sorry about my blurry screen. I've had to swap phones in the life proof case and this one is a... <laughs> the fog was <laughs> <to> <laughs> So just see the vague haze. Um, yeah, I would like to answer the career progression question and sort of follow on from David and, and add a bit of um, uh, perspective Yushan suggested about a mother's perspective towards the end. Um, so a real example of how they're not linear, these career progressions. I started off in community development, um, did a degree and worked in um, the South Pacific and did a lot of research. And when I came back to Australia, I fell into tourism um, and started taking people bushwalking and canoeing um, with no clothes, but starting to do group work. And I was about oh, early twenties at the time. Um, through that, I met an amazing employer who offered me a job um, at the place where I was doing tourism. And I ended up spending the next four years doing 70 day um, experiential education trips um, all around Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that was incredible. That was 70 days, no days off with the same group of 12. So a real introduction to um, group dynamics. <laughs> um, after that four years, I branched out to other things like Antipodeans and Red Earths with shorter trips, um, but still the same um, fun level of intensity and then realized I really needed to formalize my learning and went and got a cert for in outdoor rec <laughs> after um, a, a good chunk of time in the industry through RPL um, predominantly and, and then had to get a few rope 
um, rope skills. And then after that, I thought, oh, I really need to learn a bit more about camps, um, how, how Queensland does their outdoor ed. And I spent a good couple of years doing working for Coefficient, um, which is a sort of casual agency in Queensland. So got to see a good, I don't know, 50 50 odd different workplaces over that time and, and try my hand at a few different things. And then um, I went to a for, uh, an outdoor ed forum and got to hear about ABAT and this thing called adventure therapy. And I was just so enthused. I went up to Bryn and spoke to him at length and went to my first ABAT meeting and heard about um, a job going where I work now, at the Southern Outlook which just seemed incredible. It was an intersection of community development and outdoor ed. And these diverse skills that I'd accumulated suddenly were the prerequisites to this really great job. Um, so now I work for the government uh, doing sort of like adventure-based youth work, but at a higher programming policy sort of level. We, we, we've trained staff and social workers in how to work with young people with complex um, needs and behaviours and do it safely in the outdoors. Uh, I've been there for four years, uh, which has been wonderful. And, and in that time, taken on roles with ABAT. I was the Queensland rep for a while and um, also worked with Blue Peter, who do sailing trips um, and Recreate, who also do adventure-based um, work, therapy work with young people. So it's sort of been this weird arc that's perfectly aligned <laughs> and now as a as a um a mum looking at how I can go forward in the field and not lose my qualifications and and find adaptable ways to to continue learning and and growing as a facilitator mm -hmm. i yeah as I said looking at at starting a small business myself and seeing how that works and um returning to work flexibly part-time, but I'm, I may have to go into an um, ad, admin role for, for the time being, just not being able to be out in the field. Amazing. Yeah. It's incredible <laughs> that we've, we've got, what, 11 people here and the diversity of backgrounds and careers just here um, is incredible, which shows you the diversity of the actual industry. Mm. Fabulous. Anyone else? Can oh, there corn. Any? Oh, yep, Gav. <laughs> oh, that just said corn. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's cute. Okay, go. Go for it, Gav. Yep. Um, you know, just about the, on a total different thing of being involved with bushwalking clubs and bushwalking Queensland, mm. I just went into, into the role because growing up, I was always going out with a family bushwalking because my dad was getting annoyed with um, being called out uh, on a weekend to go back to work to do things. So he was trying to make himself scarce as possible on weekends. So we'd go bushwalking as much as possible. And it just grew from there that yeah, bushwalking became a big part of me. And and all my working life, I always found time, when I had time off, I'd just go and get myself in the bush. That was it. Um, so mm -hmm. then, th then things developed that um, I moved up to where I area where I moved to with work I was looking for a I started to get the point of didn't want to go bushwalking on my own I need to go with a group of people and there was no club in my area so I decided well I better form a club and got one going and I've been president of that club now for the since we formed it and I can't seem to shake the position of <laughs> I know how to step backwards Gap. <laughs> <laughs> but um from there we started to learn about the, the challenges with with running a club and and um, yeah, having the government trying to r realise that there are people out there that get affected by their decisions. And so then I decided to get on to with, um, with the Bushwalking Queensland, mm. get in with the clubs and then find out if, they, if they're faced with the same problems. And then just started to grow from there. I just went, this is interesting. And then I'm on Bushwalking Australia now as well to get a nationwide perspective. And just for the whole thing, just knowing how the... Um, how the whole outdoor recreation side of things, it gets affected by how government can just not really look at it and trying to get on their face all the time. And um, mm. yeah, and now we're finding that trying to create new trails is a big thing. 
well, I'm getting into little country towns around Queensland and finding out that if they can get a trail somewhere, it'll be just good for their own little own backyard, basically, and then put themselves on the map. So yeah. mm. getting onto that is, yeah, it's all part of the passion. So, yeah. So good, Gav. Thank you. Nishan, did you want to um, follow up? Um, no, thanks, Gav. Um, I mean, thanks. I think we're close to, to finish soon. Hey, Laurie? Um, thank you for, for everyone for answering the questions. Um, I find it really, really inspiring for myself to hear. Um, as someone who, well, I have been working in the tourism industry for a while, um, just over 10 years myself, and I really want to move my career into the outdoor education. And I've been freelancing <laughs> myself, uh, freelancing before having the baby. Um, so it is really inspiring for me to hear all your stories and career path. Um, is Christine raised her hand and want to add something? Kristen? Yep. <laughs> Hi there. I'm sorry. I have just come in late. And um, so I don't know. Were you asking people what career path they took to get to the outdoor industry? Uh, is, and is it helpful for me to speak? I'm sorry, I'm, I've just come in la at the very last minute, so I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> to work on this sorry. Case. Yeah, you. Uh, I have a, some questions posted on the chat, but that's one of the questions people choose to answer and share their story of their outdoor uh, career pathway, mm -hmm. uh, which we would love to hear about yours as well. And yeah, if you'd like to share with us, that'd be great. Okay, well, I... Um... Uh, I work for Bushwalking New South Wales. I'm the sole employee of the organisation. My role title is executive officer, um, but I, you know, fondly think of it as everything officer. <laughs> um, I've uh, so Bushwalking New South Wales is the peak body for recreational bushwalkers in New South Wales, and our goals are to get more people um, bushwalking and doing outdoor adventure more often. Um, and so our members are bushwalking clubs across the state and the, the clubs do things other than bushwalking, even though their name says bushwalking. So they do everything from abseiling, canyoning, whitewater rafting, um, kayaking, um, road biking, main, mountain biking, uh, snowshoeing, uh, cross-country skiing. So I, I've been uh, a member of clubs in the past and so I have the background. I actually have three degrees, just couldn't decide what to do with myself. So I've done architecture, I've done management and I've done uh, computer science. Um, but I just um, came to this, this industry um, from computer science and or, or the world of IT and IT consulting um, because of my passion. So I did bushwalking and outdoor adventure on the weekends and I just wanted to make it something that I, I worked in. So is, it, is, is that answer your question? Is that helpful? Well, yes, I think it's the same as what Dave say, like there's no single career pathway in this industry, really. Everyone have very different stories to share. And also that really just tells me, you know, there are many choices there. If you do want to find a career in this industry, you can. Mm -hmm. And it might be hard, like you might be, have to you know persist in doing what you love um, but it is possible I think that gives us hope and also um, tells you know whoever wants to get into the industry and tells us it's possible it's not just a lifestyle you can find a career in this industry and uh, I would love to hear more stories from people like yourself and people who have lots of experience in this industry more uh, in the future meetings if uh, that's possible. Mm. Fabulous, thanks, thanks everyone. And that's great, Kirsten. I can't believe you've got such a diverse background. It just shows you it's passion that really drives everyone into this industry. And, um, yeah, it just emphasises it. Great 
we look forward to um, reporting back to everyone once you shine and I'm playing with all this content and information and, and what we come of it. And then hopefully that'll also feed into the OCA working group that's also looking in this area. Um, and the more information we can get out there, the more opportunity we have. To Dave's point, this is great. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go back to our week in review. And uh, as I say, what a week. <laughs> so where we are right now, um, and apologies, we normally sort of start off the, the session with this, but I thought it was important to sort of uh, get some of the discussions around what's been going on in the careers area first. Camps, okay, so at the moment, the New South Wales government has allowed excursions to happen as of uh, next Monday. They um, have allowed incursions to happen as of uh, a couple of weeks ago. To this point, they are still not permitting overnight camps in New South Wales. And we have no clear pathway on when camps can resume, which is incredibly, not only disappointing, but also um, very disturbing because we have an industry that is relying on a market to not only assist in their own outcomes, whether it be curriculum or health or, or um uh, learning skills, social skills, we've all discussed that today, but we have an industry that's hurting and economically balancing on a, a wire to survive. Needless to say, there's been a lot of advocacy that has been going on. Um, today, I'm hoping you'll see that advocacy appear on um, the mainstream news and hopefully we can get a little bit more attention to that. Um, yes, it's been difficult and it's conversations with the members have been incredibly difficult as well as they have um, uh, really realised uh, the fact that they can't just keep hanging on. So let's hope we get some action. Let's hope we get some support from the government to keep our guys still in business and keep as many employees as we physically can. The reasoning behind it is really unclear. Um, they keep telling us that it's risky for overnight. Yet, ironically, anyone can go and book accommodation away. Uh, they can now travel into state. They could book it as a group. They could get a community group together. And guess what? Scout camps are back this weekend. So there is no reasoning behind why this should be stopped, other than I don't think that what that the current New South Wales government do not understand the benefits of our sector nor value the ben those benefits. Um, all of you know that we've been hearing from the principals going, please, when can we get back to our uh, activities? When can we start our school camps again? I've got many schools that are actually decided to hold their camp on campus, which is awesome. It means that they're actually valuing the outdoor education and trying to find ways to do it. But why should we be looking at loopholes to get our activity happening? This should not be um, a restriction placed on our kids. ACT kids are allowed to cross interstate into New South Wales and have their overnight camps now. So why can't New South Wales kids have the same benefit? Anyway, um, all that being said, we are trying to push our industry as much as possible. We had an incursion campaign that went out last week and this week. It went to over 200,000 people and uh, we're hoping that the members are getting some great uh, interest on those opportunities. Uh, we do know that excursions, uh, day excursions can happen and um, I'm hearing that the phone is ringing for some of those items, but it only is a fraction of the benefits we could be supplying these kids. So let's hope that we can get um, some commitment to Term 1 22 and start planning for that um, and hope that we can get some financial support continuing from the government. So um, if you're in Sydney, I'd tune into Channel 9 News tonight and uh, let's see what happens. Project grants. There's a lot of project grants out there um, at the moment. And the ones that I wanted to highlight to you today are the Destination New South Wales ones that have just been announced. So there's not only just regional event funding, but also product development funding. So uh, if you are in the tourism area, this is a huge opportunity. And Kirsten, I thought of your, your project, uh, particularly because we discussed this project when it closed last time, it's now about to reopen. So that is something that uh, you definitely need to look at. The other one that exists, and just quickly, I will share with you something I found on um, a newsletter this morning, 
is an opportunity for paid uh, international students work experience. So if you are wanting to get um, some uh, international students in as work experience, and they could be paid to do this through the University of Western Sydney. So if this is something of interest, um, let me know and I'll send you that link. Um, but what a great opportunity to get our international students into the outdoors, get some great experience and be paid for that opportunity via a third party. So um, have a look at that uh, if you are interested. Now, sorry, let me go back to my PowerPoint. I've just lost it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Navigating the ship here is never fun. Okay, so project grants. Um, and look, a huge reminder to everyone on um, getting back to activity. I know I say this every week, but I cannot stress this enough. We have seen way too many incidents or near incidents as we started to get back. And my thoughts and prayers go to the people in America after the fatality yesterday on the zip line. Um, just something that we should not be seeing in our industry and it just shows that risk management um, still has to be at the forefront of everything that we do. We are the most vulnerable as we get back to operation. Our processes and procedures are a little bit rusty. We need to get that back. And don't forget our AAAS audit program. So if you are wanting to review your processes, we have an opportunity for that as well. The topics coming up in our Connect and Shares, uh, we have Defence and the Outdoors coming up. We've got a Destination New South Wales update with their brand new campaign. Um, supplier and retailer updates, up, updates, updates, updates on supply issues. Uh, some of you may already know that uh, some of the supplies that we need for our industry are uh, not appearing until 2023 in some cases. So we need to understand a little bit more about that to ensure that we are on top of those issues. And needless to say, insurance is a big topic right now, and uh, we will be having a Q and A session and some um, some tips on that in um, in the near future. If there is any topics that you go, oh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, um, please let us know, and we'll put it on the agenda. Um, Dom, did you want to talk about nature play in the outdoor classroom day? Because my next point was around nature play, so I'll let you talk first. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was just a comment Dave put on there that there was, it was Outdoor Classroom Day um, world, internationally, um, this week. Um, so we promoted that through our Nature Play Queensland program for the last few years. Um, it hasn't had as big a push this year, which was partly a financial thing. But, um, yeah, like last year, I think we had, oh, I can't remember the top of my head, it was several hundred Queensland schools were engaged in it. We're trying to switch it into not being outdoor classroom day, but making outdoor learning a normal part of schools. So it's one thing to have everyone go out on one day, but it's more about getting it embedded within the school system so that yeah. teachers actually regularly do, do outdoor learning with their, with their students, even whether it's a maths class or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's part of what we've been working on with the outdoor classroom day as part of our nature play program, but, and so have others across in the nature play network across Australia. Um, and that's been yeah, quite positive. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and I think that is something that we need to leverage a little bit more. Obviously, in New South Wales, they literally just got back to the classroom. So, so we had a bit of a challenge in doing much more this year, but a uh, really great point. And to, to your uh, nature play, we were so excited to have our very first New South Wales nature play meeting yesterday. So uh, we are off and running and uh, look forward to showing a lot more results from the New South Wales. And we're not calling it nature play just yet but let's just use that as a term for the moment uh, about what we can do in that space um, we've got some amazing people at the table including Parsi Salberg um, and of course uh, Amanda Lloyd is is herding the cats into uh, what we need to to stand for and, and what we need to do so thank you for bringing that up it was perfect timing Brianna I've just noticed you've popped on how are you <laughs> yes hey team sorry that's the um Oh, my internet's not particularly great. Okay. Um, I live in New South Wales, but work in Queensland. So it's kind of a double, I'm kind of representing just on the border at work at the moment. So apologies about my uh, delay. I uh, just finished up a session at uh, nine. It is 10 o'clock on my end. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I thought I was early, but definitely an hour late. So that's exactly okay. Good. I, but, I um, do, the suit of Queensland uh, really oh. 
daylight savings the way oh, it would be. <laughs> I literally, within half an hour of my home, but hey, I'm learning all the time. Sorry about the mower in the background, but yeah, amazing to be on here. Thank you for the invite. Uh, great to see some very familiar faces on here. Um, I was going to say, and, we've got more Queenslanders today than New South Wales. Oh, There's nothing going wrong yeah. here. So I'll maybe uh, do yeah. mine and I'll do yeah. your session. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, great to hear what's happening uh, in uh, uh, in uh, on your end, um, and also just feel that both from a New South Wales perspective, I guess, from um, the adventure therapy concept, and with our team there, what we're doing in place to try and bring some of our. I'm just going to try and go this slide. Um, try and bring some of our on ground providers into that, um, and then also, uh, I guess, from a Queensland perspective, having. A Sorry about the lawnmower in at work at the moment. Um, yeah, and then on Queensland, obviously, I might just mute. Sorry for a minute. That's okay. <laughs> so as I said before, Brianna is um, our New South Wales representative for ABAT. Um, but, yeah, obviously in Queensland at the moment. Um, David, that's awesome. When Thursday, Friday morning, what time our time? Well, what time your time or what time New South Wales time? <laughs> Um, yeah, the uh, Association for Experiential Education based out of uh, uh, East Coast New York time, uh, uh, they're running their virtual conference second year in a row. They had a massive, they're the biggest conference, I believe, on the planet. Um, that's a big statement, but I think it's correct for experiential educators. So outdoor educators, school camps, um, whatever you might do in the outdoor recreation space, it's not uniquely to schools or universities. Um, they're running uh, a campaign where pay what you can afford effectively. So I think I paid $85 US, which is about $100 for four days of programming. And it's action packed from about midnight, um, Thursday night, going in the Friday morning, all the way through to um, about 6am Monday morning. So I've actually taken Sunday, Friday and Monday off and I'm going to camp out in a conference a hotel away from my housemate so I can interact in the, at three in the morning with him uh, with uh, with the conference um, they have breakout rooms they have uh, presentations they have game sessions uh, they have a thing called gather town where they just you get a little uh, emoji type thing a little avatar and you walk around and you meet other people and your camera connects and you have random conversations and I'll hopefully be hosting an Australian uh, space in that um, for networking within an Australian group there's a couple of Australians who have registered. I'm aware of that. Um, it's a really cheap option. And in a world world where we're all locked down or have been, and we can't gather together physically, so uh, it's a great way to do it. So I, I suggest everyone jump on there. If you've got the time, it is really late for us, but the registrations close on Wednesday um, and it is quite cheap. So um, it's worth the, uh, the, the look at it. And um, uh, we'll inside the outhouse we'll be talking about it possibly uh the monday evening afterwards if we have any um, um uh, any uh, uh, cell, uh brain cells left after being up all night for four nights <laughs> sounds great thanks for sharing that awesome i've got to i've got to go i've got a meeting with my boss i'll talk to you guys later uh keep your uh, heads up new south wales wonderful thanks dave um brianna we might have to close it off but maybe if you give us a rundown on the symposium in another week would that uh would that work Yep, you're on mute, John. Let's, let's do that. Let's okay. catch up another week. All okay. right, sounds good. Thanks so much. All right, guys, we'll let you get on with your days. And uh, thank you for your interaction today. That was a great session just about careers. And, and let's hope by next week we're going to either have some more news or um, some positive news about where we sit in New South Wales with our education side of our sector. Um, have a great week, have a great weekend, and uh, please remember that we have happy hour at four o'clock if you just want to have a, a chat and a release. And uh, yeah, needless to say, I'll be having my wine uh, and uh, releasing <laughs> some of the stress of the week. So uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Have a great weekend. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks, Thanks Laurie. Thanks for a lot of work you've been doing. And we'll see you when you're going to host ours in yeah. an hour or so. Yeah, no exactly. worries. I'll, I'll sit back and take a break. Yeah. <laughs> All right.